good evening. Please leave the light on. Tonight, dedicated to the thirsty undead, Mrs. Edith Wharton demonstrates. They eagerly accompany us from the mists of Gothic into the modern world and even into the new world. Indeed, according to her story, Bewitched, it would seem there is no escaping them. The snow was still falling thickly when Orrin Bosworth drove up to Saul Rutledge's gate. He was surprised to see two others ahead of him. Bosworth recognised Deacon Hibben from North Ashmore and Sylvester Brand, the widower from the old Bearcliff farm. The three clapped their numb hands together and greeted each other. Mrs. Rutledge sent me a message to come, Bosworth volunteered. The deacon nodded. I got a word from her too. I hope there's no trouble here. The two men, followed by Sylvester Brand, walked to the front door. The door opened, and Mrs. Rutledge stood before them. Walk right in, she said. The room into which she led the three men had a black stove planted on a sheet of zinc. A newly lit fire smouldered reluctantly, and the room was at once close and bitterly cold. I presume you folks are wondering what it is I asked you to come here for. We're in trouble here, and that's the fact. And we need advice. Mr. Rutledge and myself do. She cleared her throat and added, There's a spell been cast over Mr. Rutledge. The deacon looked up sharply. A spell? That's what I said. He's bewitched. Do you care to give us more particulars before your husband joins us? No, I'll wait. A silence fell during which the four persons present seemed all to be listening for the sound of a step, but none was heard, and after a minute or two Mrs. Rutledge began to speak again. It's down by that old shack on Lammer's Pond, that's where they meet. Bosworth, whose eyes were on Sylvester Brand's face, fancied he saw a sort of inner flush darken the farmer's heavy leathern skin. Deacon Hibben leaned forward, a glitter of curiosity in his eyes. They, who, Mrs. Rutledge? My husband, Saul Rutledge, and her. Sylvester Brand again stirred in his seat. Who do you mean by her? he asked abruptly. Mrs. Rutledge revolved her head on her long neck and looked at him. Your daughter, Sylvester Brand. My, my daughter? What the hell are you talking about? Your daughter, Aura, Mr. Brand. Brand gave a laugh. My dead daughter. That's what Mr. Rutledge says. If you wait a minute, he'll tell you with his own words. That's what I've got you here for, to see for yourselves what's come over him. Then you'll talk different. The deacon raised a lean hand of interrogation. Mrs. Rutledge, what makes you think... A thin smile of disdain narrowed her colorless lips. I don't think... I know. Well, but how? I seen him. Saul Rutledge and... and Aura Brand. That's so. Sylvester Brand's chair fell backward with a crash. Here, let me get out of this. I want to see Saul Rutledge himself and tell him... Well, here he is, said Mrs. Rutledge. The outer door had opened. Saul Rutledge entered. As he came in, he faced the light from the north window and Bosworth's first thought was that he looked like a drowned man fished out from under the ice. The deacon sought for a word to ease the horror. Sit down then, Saul. Draw up to us, won't you? Well, we've heard what Mrs. Rutledge says. What's your answer? I don't know as there's any answer. She found us. And you mean to tell me the person with you was... was what you took to be... The deacon's thin voice grew thinner. Aura Brand? Saul Rutledge nodded. You knew, or thought you knew, you were meeting with the dead. Well, he said, I guess it begun a way back, before even I was married to Mrs. Rutledge. You know, he added, Aura and me was to have been married. We kept company. But Aura, she was very young. Mr. Brand here sent her away. She was gone nigh to three years, I guess. When she come back, I was married. That's right, Brand said. 
And after she came back, did you meet her again? The deacon continued. Alive? Rutledge questioned. A perceptible shudder ran through the room. Well, of course, said the deacon nervously. Rutledge seemed to consider. Once I did. Only once. There was a lot of other people around. At Cold Corners Fair it was. Did you talk with her then? Only a minute. What did she say? His voice dropped. She said she was sick and knew she was going to die, and when she was dead, she'd come back to me. And what did you answer? Nothing. Did you think anything of it at the time? Well, no. Not till I heard she was dead, I didn't. After that, I thought of it. And I guess she drew me. Drew you down to that abandoned house by the pond. How did you know it was there she wanted you to come? She just drew me. Often? That's as it happens. But haven't you the strength to keep away from the place? A spectral smile narrowed his colorless lips. Ain't any use. She follows after me. These are forbidden things. You know that's all. Have you tried prayer? But Mrs. Rutledge intervened. Prayer ain't any good. And this kind of thing, it ain't no manner of use. You know it ain't. Ain't any of you folks got the grit? Deacon Hibben held up his hand. That's no way, Mrs. Rutledge. This ain't a question of having grit. What we want, first of all, is proof. That's so, said Brand with an explosion of relief. See here, Saul Rutledge, you gotta clear up this damn calumny or I'll know why. You say my dead girl comes to you? He labored with his breath. When? You tell me that and I'll be there. Rutledge's head drooped a little, and his eyes wandered to the window. Ran about sunset, mostly. You know beforehand? Rutledge made a sign of assent. Well, then. Tomorrow will it be? Rutledge made the same sign. Brand turned to the door. I'll be there. That was all he said. He strode out between them without another glance or word. Deacon Hibben looked at Mrs. Rutledge. We'll be there too, he said, as if she had asked him, but she had not spoken. And Bosworth saw that her thin body was trembling all over. He was glad when he and Hibben were out again in the snow. Brand got into his sleigh and drove off under the snow-smothered hemlocks. Bosworth scrambled into his sleigh and was driving off in his turn when he heard his companion calling after him. The deacon explained that his horse had cast a shoe. Would Bosworth drive him down to the forge near North Ashmore if it wasn't too much out of his way? Bosworth made room for him under the bearskin, and the two men drove off. The shortest way to the forge passed close by Lammer's Pond. That's the house, that tumble-down shack over there, I suppose. Yes, that's the house. Suddenly, he gave an exclamation. Look! He had jumped out of the sleigh and was stumbling up the bank toward the slope of snow. On it, turned in the direction of the house by the pond, he had detected a woman's footprints. Two, then three, then more. The deacon scrambled out after him, and they stood and stared. God, barefoot, Hibben gasped. They got into the sleigh and drove on. As they rounded the turn, they saw Brand's cutter ahead of them, the horse tied to a tree trunk. This was not Brand's nearest way home. Bosworth found himself shivering all over under his bearskin. I wish to God the dark wasn't coming on, he muttered. He tethered his own horse near Brand's, and without a word, he and the deacon ploughed through the snow, in the track of Brand's huge feet. They had only a few yards to walk to overtake him. When Bosworth spoke his name, he stopped short and turned. He looked at them dully, but without surprise. I wanted to see the place he merely said. The deacon cleared his throat. Yes, we thought so. But I guess there won't be anything to see. The three men came out together in the cleared space before the house. Brand stopped with a jerk and pointed to the same light footprints turned toward the house. The track of a woman in the snow. Bare feet, he said. He went up to the door of the crazy house, pushed it inward and, meeting with an unexpected resistance, thrust his heavy shoulder against the panel. The door collapsed like a playing card and Bran stumbled after it into the darkness of the hut. The others, after a moment's hesitation, followed.
Bosworth was never quite sure in what order the events that succeeded took place. Coming in out of the snow dazzle, he seemed to be plunging into total blackness. He groped his way across the threshold, caught a sharp splinter of the fallen door in his palm, seemed to see something white and wraith-like surge up out of the darkest corner of the hut, and then heard a revolver shot at his elbow and a cry. Brand had turned back and was staggering past him out into the lingering daylight. The sunset suddenly flushing through the trees crimsoned his face like blood. He held a revolver in his hand and looked about him in his stupid way. They do walk then, he said, and began to laugh. He bent his head to examine his weapon. Better here than in the churchyard. They shan't dig her up now, he shouted out. The two men caught him by the arms, and Bosworth got the revolver away from him. The next day, Bosworth's sister Loretta asked him if he had heard the news. What news? Venny Brand's down sick with pneumonia. The deacon's been there. I guess she's dying. Venny Brand, he echoed. She's a child. Well, repeated his sister, I guess she's dying. After a pause, she added, It'll kill Sylvester Brand all alone up there. Venny Brand was buried three days later. The service was over. The coffin of Venny Brand had been lowered into her sister's grave, and the neighbours were slowly dispersing. Bosworth felt obliged to say a word to the stricken father. He waited till Brand had turned from the grave with the deacon at his side. Brand's face was the closed door of a vault, barred with wrinkles like bands of iron. Loretta Bosworth was talking with the other women while the men unblanketed their horses. As Bosworth waited for her, a few feet off he saw Mrs. Rutledge's tall bonnet lording it above the group. Saul ain't here today, Mrs. Rutledge, is he? One of the village elders piped. Bosworth heard her measure out her answer in slow, incisive words. No, Mr. Rutledge, he ain't here. He would have come for certain, but his aunt Menorca Cummins is being buried down to Stotesbury this very day, and he had to go down there. Don't it sometimes seem as if we was all walking right in the shadow of death? The deacon went up to her. Bosworth heard the deacon say, I'm glad to hear that Saul is able to be up and around. She turned her small head on her rigid neck and lifted the lids of marble. Yes, I guess he'll sleep quieter now. And her too, maybe, now she don't lay there alone any longer, she added in a low voice, with a sudden twist of her chin towards the fresh black stain in the graveyard snow. She got into the cutter and said in a clear tone to Andy Pond, so long as we're down here, I don't know but what I'll just call round and get a box of soap at Hiram Pringles. Tomorrow night, if you're free, I'd like to introduce you to someone with a singular obsession. An obsession with a bat.